uh, in private practice here in Cambridge. And with me today is Kim Jisbell, who is a staff attorney at the Citizens Media Law Project at Berkman Center for Internet Society at Harvard Law School. If you want to say a few minutes, I believe. You'll hear more about later. Okay. So we're here to um, talk to you today about some of the most relevant and pressing legal issues for bloggers to be thinking about. Uh, I'm going to concentrate primarily on intellectual property issues, mostly trademark and copyright um, concerns. And then uh, Kim is going to talk to you uh, a bit further about avoiding liability and some of the other areas of the law that are most relevant to bloggers. Um, I'm going to jump right in by talking about trademarks and why bloggers should be thinking about them and how we should be approaching them. Um, you may not have thought much about trademarks but I like to tell people that one way to think about them um, to underscore the importance of what a trademark can mean for you as bloggers is to think about the amount of work it takes to establish in the minds of your readers an association between the name of your blog and the quality of content that they're going to get there. So it takes a long time. Everybody here, um, assuming you have blogs or worked on blogs, knows that it takes a while before you know you, your, your posts are such that people are, are can trust that when they go to your site once a week or once a day, they're going to get quality content and they know what they're going to get. And that association in their mind is really what trademark law is about protecting because that's what goes away when your trademark rights are diminished because you haven't um, protected them properly and somebody's maybe infringing them by coming up with a, another blog that um, has a name that's similar to yours and then all of a sudden people who are thinking, you know, they have a vague idea of the existence of your blog and they're out searching for it and they find this other one and they go there. Um, so that's what you're trying to prevent, that, um, that goodwill that you're always trying to work on by you know, creating quality posts time after time and um, creating an association in people's minds their readers' minds and what they're getting from you by virtue of, of your name um, on your blog, the same thing every time they come. Um, so you want to protect that. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, you, try, you want to try and make sure when you're thinking of a name of a blog um, or some feature of your blog and you think it's going to have a name that's worthy of protection, um, you want to make sure there are as few problems on the horizon as possible for that name, hopefully before you've thought of it, or, or, or rather before you've started using the name, um, you've given some thought to um, to searching out other or possible problems with that name before you start using it. So um, those of you who have existing blogs and you have great names that you really love and you really want to make sure that um, you know, you're not going to run any problems, um, you know, you've, you've missed the point where you can could do searching for trademarks before you jump in, but that doesn't mean um, that at this point you can't do a little bit of searching around um, the people who are using trademarks that are similar to yours or that you know, may be a problem down the road but haven't yet uh, percolated up. So um, when talking about searching a bit for trademarks, um, primarily for those who are thinking about new blogs or new ideas that are going to have trademarks associated with them, but also for people who are using existing names and want to kind of see what's out there. Um, obviously, you can do a Google search for a trademark that you're thinking of using. You can find um, interesting things that way. People who are doing things similar to what you're doing or being dissimilar, but they have similar mark. Um, whether that, that, not that the problem is you know, an analysis that you have to think about on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, beyond the Google search, a lot of people do um, searching of domain names. So they're thinking of names that they want to use for things. Um, on the assumption that if the domain name is available and somebody, you know, nobody cares about that name, they can just use it forever. It's not necessarily a safe assumption, so you definitely want to, um, even if you can find a domain name for a trademark that you want to use, not stop there, do a little bit of Google searching, and even go um, to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's website where they have publicly accessible a database that you can search of trademarks that are registered at the federal level or that have been applied for registry. Level and uh, this is a good time to introduce this little handout that I've put um, on seats. I've got a few links to some sites that I'll be mentioning um, through my talk, and I just realized that I just threw my friend. So I'll just see. Okay, we'll get back to All right, so this little handout has some links. 
um, to sites that are going to be helpful um, to investigating some of the things I'm going to be talking about and um, search site for the U.S. Patent Trademark Office is number one on there. And I'll mention a few other things as we go. Um, all right, so let's say you search your trademark out um, and you find that it's clear. Um, you know, maybe you, maybe you have an attorney helping with that. Maybe you want to do it on your own. Uh, my general caveat for, for all the things I'm talking about is that obviously, um, ideally, you would like to consult with an attorney on these things, but if you really want to put in the effort and the research in you know, how to do things like search out trademarks and register copyrights and things like that on your own, it's possible certainly to do things, um, but I would, uh, I would plead with you to avail yourself to professional legal help, you know, if that's at all within the realm of possibility of doing particular um, laws or businesses. Um, so you, you searched out a trademark, you want to go and protect it, how do you do that? Well, um, the most obvious choice is to try and register your trademark at the federal level. Um, you do that at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. They have an online system for registering trademarks. And um, again, you, know, you can figure out as best you can what information you need to put in and how you would need to construct the application so that it's, um, it's not going to run into any problems. And um, you, know, you put that in an operator, you pay a fee, and then they examine it, come back, tell you if there's any problems. And um, if they're already have to get past them, if they're going to the application for the registration. That's kind of in a very short nutshell the application process for trademarks. Ideally, you'd like to have a federal trademark registration for any trademark that you're going to use and that you think has value and that you don't want people to uh, infringe. Once you have a trademark registration, or if you're content to not ever have a trademark registration, just rely on the fact that you're using a mark that gives you rights under um, uh, state law, just by virtue of the fact that you're out in commerce using the mark. Um, it does give you some rights, some registration, but whether you're registered, your tra whether you're registered your trademark or not, you want to start to think about policing the thing once you're at the point where you value this mark. Because um, trademark rights in the United States um, very much depend on the fact that you are making sure nobody else is using your trademark once you set out to protect it. Um, obviously, if somebody is just uh, blatantly infringing your trademark, offering competitive service under a, a, a similar identical name, and you're not doing anything about it, then the view of the law is that that starts to diminish your ability to stop anybody. Using a trademark that's similar to yours. So there is a little bit of an obligation to kind of keep on that. You've got trademarks that you're trying to protect, and you um, should certainly find you occasionally some looking out there to see what's going on with other people using marks similar to yours. Uh, I want to talk just a, a few seconds about using other people's trademarks in the context of uh, blog content. Um, there have been some issues recently, there was only some. Uh, concern about whether I can or how you can use the trademarks of others. I'm, there are a few things that are, that are pretty clear, which is um, that if you just refer to somebody's trademark, Coca Cola, IBM, uh, you know, anybody who's got a, 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 a trademark, in the context of doing some editorial content or some news, and you're just really referring to that trademark to um, to refer to a company that offers products and services under that trademark, that's obviously. Okay, things get a little bit uh, hazy. Um, there was a case recently where a, um, I forget which blog it was, but they were an advertise. They were, they were some sort of advertising blog that did um, commentary and, and, and criticism about you know, advertising campaigns. And they, they came up with this fake ad um, that uh, had a picture of that crash uh, airline in New York that, that went in the, the uh, Hudson River, and, it, and then they had the logo of a different airline that was like Virgin um, Atlantic or Virgin USA. And they said, you know, like, this doesn't happen to us or something like that. Well, Virgin saw that, and they, um, and I, did you ever hear about this case in the context of the CLP? I briefly saw a reference to it, okay. but I haven't followed it. All right, so it wasn't a huge thing. I think it might still be pending. But anyway, so that was an example of something used the logo of Virgin Atlantic to make this parody ad, and you know I think most lawyers in the know would say that's probably uh, you know pretty clear parody use. Not that there's anything that clear about parody use of trademarks. Um, 
at least under current U.S. law. But in any event, that's a situation where you know you might want to use a trademark on a third party, and you might have problems not so because you're wrong to do it under the law, but because you attract enough attention from Virgin or whoever is the trademark holder to cause problems. You. So, so um, don't do anything that would confuse anybody into thinking that um, there's an association with the blog and, and the owner of the trademark, and um, that's the kind of the, 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 the sort of baseline you want to follow. And anything um, beyond that, then you want to consider asking the lawyer for sure the use is OK. But obviously, using things in the context of virtual content, going from Microsoft by name, things like that are, are, are generally going to be fine. Um, I want to talk about copyright next. Um, so you're creating a blog. You've got a lot of great content on there. You don't want people to steal that content, just to take your blog posts and publish them somewhere else. Um, in the US, copyright vests when you uh, fix a creative work in a tangible medium. So if you're typing something and it's saved to a disk, and that disk is a you know, tangible medium because it's physical in nature, then you have copyright ownership over that content. All right, so you're saying, oh boy, that's great. I'm just going to write some stuff, and it's copyright protected, and I'm good to go. Um, not so fast. The reason why you care about copyright is because you don't want people to do things with it. And the only way you can really stop them by force of law in the United States is by suing them. And in order to sue somebody for copyright infringement in the United States, you have to have a copyright registration. So it becomes very important if you have copyrighted material that you actually think you might, um, that somebody might be attempted, or might attempt, attempt to steal, and that you might want to protect um, by a lawsuit or threat of lawsuit, then you want to think about a registration. Getting a copyright registration um, has other advantages other than just allowing you to walk into court and to um, protect it in that way. Uh, you also get statutory damages statutory damages are available, which are important, because under copyright law, um, a judge can award you damages as an owner of a uh, 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 registered copyright that they couldn't otherwise do um, if you had not registered that copyright before somebody started infringing. So let's take a, let's take a practical example. You wrote a great uh, blog entry, it took you a week to write this thing, you put it up there, and then it gets stolen wholesale by somebody. Um, if you hadn't registered that at all, then what you'd be doing, you, you basically face a position where you got to get a registration if you want to sue. Let's, let's say negotiations didn't work out, you're a real jerk, and you wanted to chase this thing um, as far as you could. So you want to go sue them. Like, well, you got to go get a registration. And you can do that at the last minute. It's expensive to do it because they charge a big, huge fee to do that. Um, but you can do it. But if you don't do it until after the infringement has already started, then you lose this ability to get these statutory damages. You walk into court, and the judge might say, oh, well, I see this person who stole your stuff. Um, you know, they have a, a website that makes $100 a year. So, um, and you may, may only make you know, a small amount of your stuff. So uh, they may not be willing to award you Damage. And oh, by the way, you had to pay your lawyer $100,000 to bring this case, and you can't get that back either because you didn't register in time to qualify for getting your attorney's fees back. So you want to register your copyrights in your material if you think it's important, and if you think somebody will eventually take advantage of that someday and um, do something that would cause you to want to go chase them in court. That's not to say, I see with the question. I think we said we're going to hold questions just at the end. Appreciate it. Almost the end. Hopefully, we'll have a few minutes at the end. Um, so, 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 you want to. Bottom line, you want to register your copyright um, for any material that you think is important enough that you, know, you might want to chase them down if they were to infringe that. So, how do you do that? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, registering copyright is just a matter of going to the copyrights office. It, there's an online filing mechanism, so you fill in information about the work about. Um, yourself as the author, you pay a, a, a fairly small fee, it's $35 per application, and um, and you submit your copy of whatever you're protecting. Um, there's a little bit of fuzziness around registration of, uh, of uh, 
websites that are like blogs that have very rapidly changing content because it's not quite a, a newspaper or a magazine, but it's also not a software program. And so um, the copyright office is sort of stuck in their um, mode of thinking that everything is the same. And so those are a little bit different, but there are kind of accepted norms now for applying uh, to register the, the types of uh, sites that operate like blogs and get updated regularly. So it is being done. There are norms out there. Um, it's not that big a deal these days, even though it's a bit of a, a work around the system. Um, um, so you've got your copyright, your trademarks, all locked up and protected. Great no one's going to steal them if they do. They're in the world of hurts. Um, I'm talking a little bit about using, um, and Kim will touch on this as well in the context of some laws that in certain ways, but I want to talk a little bit about the idea of using other people's copyrighted stuff in your blog, because that's a very common thing you want to do. You want to take some images from somewhere, and you want to take, um, you want to, you know, take some, some quotes from a, an article out somewhere else, or a book, and use them in your blog. The general rule is that you can't take anything without permission. But the big and most relevant exception to that is that there's something called fair use. And um, the real trick is trying to figure out if you're satisfied that a use that you want to make of somebody's copyright material is going to be fair use. And the answer to that is unfortunately much less clear than you'd like to be because there's a four prong test where you look at the use that you want to make and you ask all these questions about it and um, sort of see how the, you know, if, if each of those questions kind of favors following your use fair, then okay, it's probably fair use if each of them doesn't favor it, then you're probably not doing something that's going to be considered fair use, and maybe you don't want to do it, but what if it's a split? You don't know. All right, so here's a little more clarity than that on things. There are things that are pretty clearly fair use. Um, the first prong of this test to decide whether a use of some copyright material is a fair use is, um, is, the, is the nature of the use that you're making, whether or not under the, the copyright laws and the developed cases, your use is transformative. So are you doing something that is the same as what the copyrighted work that you're using is doing, or are you doing something different? So let's say there's a book out there, okay, and you want to take some some length, some maybe a paragraph or two from that book, to put into another book that you just want to use that exact same language. They're both books. They're both doing the same thing, but there's a text in those books, so it's not very different. That's not different at all. That's a stupid example because it probably would never happen. But that's not very useful because it's not transformative. You're doing anything different now. Like, take a par paragraph in that book and put it in a blog post because you're trying to make a point about that book and the review you're doing for your blog. Well, that's a very different use than you know, of that text that you've taken than, than, than the purpose that's served when that text is inside the book that you take it from. Right? So that's much more likely to be a fair use with respect to that wrong see a burning question. I'll permit it. Yes. Can you address then how a news aggregator site makes a profit fairly then from aggregating content that they don't own or publish or produce and just reproduce that content wholesale? Yeah, well what's the legality behind it? How can an aggregator site do that? A news aggregator site, well I'm gonna have to look at the particular what they're what they're doing. Are they taking titles? Alone, are they taking the first paragraph of the story, even if it's in an RSS feed that you know includes that data? Um, what are they, you know, what are they doing? Uh, if they are taking substantial amounts of content, um, well, I'll say this first: there's no cases on that, right? So that's the standard lawyer cop out. Um, there's no cases on it, so we don't really know. Pay me a thousand dollars an hour, and I'll tell you if you don't know. Um, Actually, the answer is that frankly. Watch this website. We are coming out with a white paper on this aggregation in March. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. And that that will be plug number two on the slow research. Shoot. Uh, there's a, a link to the legal guide published by the Citizens Media Law Project, which touches on everything I'm talking about, and everything that Kim's talking about, and a ton of other great stuff. So it's pretty much you know one stop shopping for a ton of legal issues, all related to the blogs. You definitely check out the last link if you do nothing else. 
Um, but anyway, so that's that's definitely a tricky issue. I mean, it's 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 kind of like what is the most famous uh, uh, fair use case in the context of the internet, which is this case from some boy, uh, probably like ten years ago, where um, uh, a company was creating a an aggregator of images. So they were using thumbnail images, small these images, basically like a search engine, kind of like Google images before there was Google images. And there was this big question, well, you know, boy, is they're copying all these images? Um, like what is that? And that was fair use because what they were doing was very transformative. By creating a search engine, they were serving a very different purpose than whatever purpose the original images that they were using, you know, was doing. So that image was being used in a story somewhere. That's obviously not what the search engine was intended to do. So that's uh, I'm giving a short trip to that decision, but that's an example of something that's a little bit similar. Uh, whether or not there will be a blockbuster case on news application, I don't know. I'd love to see it though, because I do get that question. I haven't been you know, asked that question by businesses that are doing that, and there's lots of it, and there's definitely some lack of clarity. All right, so just to wrap up, um, I don't know what I'm going to running over here. Sorry to check my All right, I'm running over. So, um, fair use. Just just to wrap that up, I mean, there are, so there's any given situation that you want is unlikely to have a great answer, you know, because there's been a case on that exact point, and, uh, and there's a very clear yes or no to the use that you want to make. But um, there are some, some guidelines. Generally, for, for image data, assuming that something is not in the public domain or that there's not some other reason why it's not really protected, um, you probably don't want to just wholesale take an image. I mean, certainly like a news image at the Boston Globe or some other site, you wouldn't take just to put in your story about the similar thing. That's not, even though news reporting is one of the categories that's actually listed in the statute for um, some of the classical fair use reasoning or, or, or justifications, um, that's not, you know, just because you're doing news reporting doesn't mean you can do anything. Taking an image from somebody else to illustrate um, your article on the same thing is not really a fair use, so you don't want to do that. Um, so you want to use permission or image that you use. Example of where you might take an image and it might be fair use is if you, what if you did a screenshot of, a, of a, some website because you want to comment on that website. And by doing that, you're taking you know an image of their layout and whatever happens to be on their page, which probably is copyright protected. I would say that's pretty likely to be fair use. I mean, again, exact cases on that, but that's pretty likely because what you're taking is something that is sort of necessary for the comment for the you want to take, and you're only taking you know, the amount that you need to take in order to make that point, um, and what you're doing is transformative because you're not trying to, well, unless you just took a screen capture of the site, you know, to, uh, to get around taking the, the exact picture you want, then for the screen capture on it, obviously it would not be very legitimate uh, reason for fair use, but if you want. So that's just one example. Take a screenshot of an entire site if you want to do some news commentary on it and critique it. Um, story titles, I was going to actually talk a little bit about. Um, you, know, you can certainly probably reference the titles of stories from other sites and, and, and make them into links, and that's probably fine. You can take wholesale a bunch of titles, a little sketch here, take the titles and you know, the first two or three sentences, even if you did that on a one-off basis. If you did that on, in aggregate, it starts to get a little bit sketchy. The Associated Press, um, not too long ago, came out with a position that they were going to consider that. Basically, they were going to consider like, any amount of taking of their titles and, and, and lead paragraphs and the printing of this button. Ten words. Was that? I think the Ten words was the key number for them? Yeah. So, you know, that was just an example of what somebody out there was copyrighted said that they were going to deem to be something they're going to chase. It doesn't mean it's, that's what the law does if they want. But anyway, so I'm going to wrap up there and hand over to Kim to talk about some other issues. So this is going to be the 1,000 foot level view of all of these issues. I'm going to point you to our website for more information. We have our legal guide. It has information on pretty much anything you could want as an online publisher, from how to form a company, how not to get sued for defamation, what's fair use. It's all there. I suggest you check it out. There's some pamphlets in the back if you didn't catch the URL. Legal risks associated with news gathering and publishing. First, everyone I'm sure has heard this defamation. It's part of a sort of 
grouping of what we call reputational torts includes defamation, libel, slander, and false light. Basically, what it means is you are saying or implying, if you, you don't have to come out and say it, if you imply it, a factual assertion about someone that is not true and it is of the type of information that would harm their reputation, they could try to sue you for defamation. Now, in that definition, that gives you some ideas of what some of the defenses to defamation are. First, it has to be false. If it's true, if I say Michael Vick is a criminal, he's been convicted. That's true. You can't sue me for defamation. If I, um, but if I say, you know, Michael Vick is a murderer, well, depends. Do I specify that, you know, he murdered dogs? Or do I just say murderer, which implies a human? That's probably defamation. Um, another sort of get out of jail free card there is it must be a factual statement. Meaning, it has to be something that you can prove or disprove. If I say, Michael Vick is a jerk, well, how do you prove? What is a jerk? How do you prove that he's a jerk or, you know, he's a swell upstanding guy? A defense is if it's an opinion. Um, but you have to be very clear that it's an opinion, not a factual statement. Also, there's another sort of get out of jail free card that we really like, um, but that gets you into trouble if you're talking about private citizens. There is what's called a public figure. <coughs> if it is someone who is famous or someone who has inserted themselves into a public debate, you have a special, there's a special pleading requirement for them to sue you for defamation. They have to show that you're willful. Not that it was just false, but that you knew it was false. Or any blind man could see that it was false and you were completely reckless and anyone should have known that it was false. So, for example, what is, you know, when we say what's a public figure? Obviously, Michael Vick, if you're talking about Martha Copley and her campaign, she's a public figure. But there are also private citizens who, for certain circumstances, can be considered a public figure. If you were writing about the 2008 campaign, Jill the Plumber would be a limited a limited public figure. So if you're writing about tax issues and you're mentioning the fact that, oh gee, he hasn't paid taxes for the past 10 years and he has inserted himself into the public debate on taxes, he's a public figure for that purpose. Now, if you're writing about the fact that he, you know, kicks his dog and is really mean to people or, you know, he's committed a small petty theft of shoplifting, uh, maybe he's not a public figure for that purpose because he hasn't represented to the public that he is an expert on shoplifting or pet care. Um, there are also some other sort of broader categories of defenses. Um, briefly, there's the fair comment privilege, the fair reporting privilege, and the neutral reporting privilege. Um, these all mean specific things, but in general, if you are going to make factual assertions, you need to show your work. You need to say, I found out this based on this public record, this interview with this person, and you have to show how you got this information so that people can judge your sources rather than just anonymously say, well, he's a criminal. You say, he was convicted of this according to the public records of the Massachusetts Superior Court. Um, but you have to accurately cite your sources. You, if someone says, you know, Martha Copley is not a poor politician, and you do Martha Copley is dot 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 a poor politician, that's not important. work. Um, more information on the website. Next, privacy. Um, there are a number of, again, torts that all sort of fall within privacy. Um, there is the publication of private facts, intrusion on seclusion, and the violation of the right of publicity. 
um, we're going to talk briefly about publication of private facts. What that is, is when you publish information that was not publicly known, that is not in and of itself newsworthy, and that is of the type of information that a reasonable person would find the dissemination of upsetting. The key to know about this is, unlike defamation, truth is not a defense. So if you write on your website, my ex-girlfriend has syphilis, that's a publication of fact. And unless it was a publicly known piece of information, you're probably going to get sued. The exception to that is the newsworthy requirement. If your ex-girlfriend is a well-known speaker on abstinence and claims that she is a virgin and goes around to schools telling other kids that they should be virgins like her, and you publish the fact that she has syphilis to show that she's not a virgin, then, you know, maybe you don't get sued for publication of private facts. Other things to keep in mind. There is a difference between public and private. If you are gathering information in a private space where people have an expectation of privacy, you need to go additional steps to get them to agree to allow you to publish that information. That means no telephone lenses from the street into someone's bedroom. That means no hidden cameras, no hidden wires. This is especially important in Massachusetts, as some of you may have heard recently. The police have been using the wiretapping laws to arrest people who are using iPhones to record the police going about their business. That's because in Massachusetts, it is a two-person consent state, meaning that in order to record a conversation, you must have the consent of both people. The fact that one person knows and is recording the call is not okay in Massachusetts. It's okay in some states, but not here. Now, next, intellectual property. I'm not going to really go into this. You should have been listening. <laughs> Product and service endorsements. If you have not heard about the new FTC guidelines, you've been hiding under a rock. This means if you receive any free materials, any free services, or any money, including review copies of CDs or movie passes, and you write about the product, the service, or the company on your website, you must disclose. Now, some of you who may have worked in print are going, wait a minute, I get you know, free CDs all the time. I get to go to free movies all the time. Well, guess what? You're bloggers now. The FTC doesn't trust you. So there are different rules online and in print publications. If you need more information on this, we've just published a white paper that goes into all of the rules and regulations. Read it. User submissions and comments. You can get sued not only for what you put on your website, but for what your users put on your website. If they violate any of those things that we talked about, defamation, privacy, intellectual property, unless you have a safe harbor, you can get sued. The two important safe harbors for you to know about, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Two things you need to know about that. One. You need to have a DMCA policy that names an agent that a copyright owner can contact to have their copyrighted material removed. That agent must be registered with the Copyright Office. There are forms in the Copyright Office. Miguel has helpfully given you the link to copyright.gov. Um, you go on there, you download the form, you fill it out, you pay $105, and you now have a registered agent. Then, if a copyright owner sends you a message saying, hey, that's my picture, take it down, you must, one, respond by removing the information in a reasonable amount of time. You must provide the user who submitted that to your website with information that you've received a DMCA claim and that you've taken it down. And you must provide them a chance to file what's called a counter notice. 
if they file a counter notice saying, I think it's fair use, or I own the copyright, or they don't own the copyright, or whatever they say, it doesn't matter what they say. If they file a counter notice, the copyright owner has seven days in which to sue the user. If they don't sue, the content goes back up, you're safe. The next safe harbor, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. For the older people in the audience, you may remember the Communications Decency Act, which was an attempt to get rid of porn on the internet. Yeah, right. Um, essentially, the court struck the vast majority of the Communications Decency Act down, except Section 230, which was inserted at the last minute as sort of a giveaway to the new burgeoning internet. What it means is you are not liable for, nor do you need to take down material provided by a third party on your website unless it falls into one of two categories. First category is it violates the criminal laws. If someone is uploading child pornography to your website, take it down, take it down fast. Second area is intellectual property. But of course, we just talked about the fact that there's the DMCA. So copyright, you've got a safe harbor as long as you comply with the DMCA. So what about trademark? There's no safe harbor for trademark. So unless you want to fight, if someone sends you a trademark take down notice, I eh, think maybe you want to think about it. Practical steps to reduce your legal costs. Good journalistic practices equals lower risk. What does that mean? Strive for accuracy and check your facts. Don't write an article based on Reverend Joe Schmo. If you know that Reverend Joe Schmo stands on the corner at Harvard Station every day and preaches at the end of the world is coming, he's not going to be a very good source. You probably don't get the right facts from him. And if you get sued of what he says, you're going to have a hard time with it. Cultivate reliable sources. Approach your work ethically. Seek permission or consent to use the works or images of others. The caveat to this, which we didn't unfortunately get to before, is if it's Creative Commons licensed, you can use it as long as you comply with the licensing requirements. Meaning if it says non-commercial, it should be used non-commercially. If it says attribution, you have to give attribution. Be willing to correct your mistakes. And educate yourself about media law and develop procedures for fact-checking, rights clearance, and news gathering. Well, how do I do that? News University. It's a website run by Queer Institute. It's at newsu.org. It has little short webisodes on anything you could need to know as a journalist. Of course, my favorite is the Online Media Law, the basics for bloggers and other online publishers. Guess what? We help write it. So it's about, it'll take about an hour of your time, really well worth it. Shield laws. Some of you who may have worked in journalism in the past may wonder, well, isn't what I do protected? I'm a reporter. I have a shield law. First of all, you're in Massachusetts, so no, you don't. Rhode Island? Yeah, you do. Massachusetts has what's called common law shield laws. It's really confusing. It's not particularly well defined. You may or not want to rely on it. Um, OK. Uh, there's also, luckily for you, you're in the First Circuit, not the Seventh Circuit. The First Circuit does recognize limited shield law, well, shield protections for journalists under the First Amendment. Again, though, it's not particularly well defined. Um, there is currently pending in Congress a federal shield law. Um, unfortunately, the House passed it saying that all of you are not journalists. The Senate is trying to pass a bill that would actually protect online ventures. It's currently tied up in committee. I would suggest all of you write your congressman, write your senator, and demand that, one, they put all of you in the shield bill, and two, they pass it. Next, create appropriate website terms and conditions. That includes, don't make promises that you can't or don't intend to keep. If you have a policy of never taking anything down, even if someone complains about it, don't say in your terms and conditions that, you know, upon complaint, I'll take it down. Be clear.
clear about what information you collect from users and whether you will keep it private. Also, corollary to this is be clear what you're going to do with it and then comply with it. Don't tell people that I will never give your information away and then sell it. And, you know, if you're going to use it to harvest an email list and start spamming them, tell them that. Designate someone to receive notifications of copyright infringement under the DMCA. Now, I put this under terms and conditions because that was normally where you would put it. The Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Basically, for your purposes, if you are collecting information from or your website is geared towards children under 13, this is a really scary act. And you need a lawyer to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. For the rest of you, it's not really a problem. Insurance. Some of you may be doing blogging as a hobby. You're not trying to make any money off of it. That's fine. If you receive no ad revenue, you don't have a single Google ad on your website anywhere, your activities, if someone sues you for defamation or invasion of privacy or copyright infringement, may, stress may, be covered under your homeowner's or regular insurance. However, if you receive any income, even if it's a check from Google once a year of 16 cents, there's a good chance your insurance company is going to take the position that it is a for-profit enterprise, and therefore it's not covered under your homeowner's or regular insurance. Um, there are all sorts of media liability insurance out there. Again, if you go to the, web, the legal guide on our website, we have a decision tree that will help you go through the process of when do you need insurance, and if, to, if the answer is yes, two, what type of insurance should you get? It also contains links to most of the prominent insurance providers in the area um, with links to their media insurance policies. Where to go for help? You've done everything right, but you've still been sued. Lucky for you, we just launched the Online Media Legal Network. What this is, it is a network of pro bono or reduced fee attorneys throughout the country that are willing to help online media ventures. Now, not everyone will qualify, but we are, you know, we have pretty expansive qualification criteria, which you can find on our website. We also have a pamphlet in the back. And, you know, if nothing else, it can't hurt to call us if you run into a problem. But you don't need to wait until you've been sued to call us. We're also here to help you do things like set up a nonprofit corporation, Come up with your DMCA policy, write your terms of use and privacy policy. All of this is, you know, if you qualify financially, it's great free legal advice. So I highly encourage you to give us a call. Now, questions? Um, I work for a uh, K-12 school. Okay. Um, and, one of the, and one of the big issues that we deal with is the fair use issue. Is, is there a difference in fair use as it applies to education institutions as it would then be against anyone outside of the education area? Yes and no. That's what we get. That's why we're um, Unfortunately, a lot of people for a very long time thought, hey, I'm an educational institution. Anything I do is fair use. Um, the courts have said no. You still have to go through the test. But the fact that you're educational <coughs> will weigh heavily in your favor. Do you want to add to that? No, I think that's good. <laughs> All right. If you have like one or two more right now, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, sorry? If you had a question, I can raise your hand next time. Sorry, so, uh, sorry. Should I put the mic? Yeah. Okay. Just going back, way back to um, copyright, you're talking about, you know, in order to sue for copyright infringement, you've got to register for the copyright, you shouldn't just assume because you you know, issue the work in some sort of tangible format, you're, you're covered. Um, we also touched, about, touched upon Creative Commons licenses, and um, those are much easier to obtain, as in you kind of fill out a form online and declare your licensing, you know, kind of framework for your work, and you've got 
the, 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 what you, you defined the, the licensing for that work. Um, are there the same legal protections that the license is violated? Yeah, yeah. That's actually a very, very common uh, question I see amongst artists and so forth uh, on the internet. But the purpose of Creative Commons licensing is to create a document that tells other people what you're permitting them to do with your copyrighted material. Um, it really is totally separate from registration of your copyright so that you can then sue them if they go beyond the bounds of that Creative Commons license and the rights that it gives them or from some third party you know, who's doing something that's really unrelated to Creative Commons license at all. So they're two very distinct things, and going through the process of creating a, a Creative Commons license for your work doesn't um, convey any of the protection that copyright registration does. It does serve a very important purpose in that it allows you know, uh, other people to do things um, with it and to tell them what they can't do with those things so that, you know, presenting their good uh, license abiding citizens and they respect the Creative Commons concept that, you know, then they'll hopefully be, uh, when you do your content, you won't have to go through them, but if you do need to, then you have to get that copyright registration separately. Yeah, it's definitely got Jim, but unfortunately, last question. Uh, general uh, trademark issues. Sure. Uh, Ford Motor Company versus a Ford Mustang owners group on the internet using, I guess, trademark. Or, for the instance, uh, Leo Laporte, a uh, fairly popular blogger, is Google, and he has a show that's this week at Google. How do you determine when when you can use these things and under what circumstances? We can be both do that. Arm wrestle. Maybe I'll. Okay. We, maybe I'll tell you. Uh, quick answer is. Um, if there's confusion, there's a problem. Even if there's not confusion, there can still be a problem. It's a very famous name like Ford. We'll talk afterwards, and I just got the time. We have to quit. We'll Thank hang you. out some in the back if you want. Yeah, thanks very much, guys.